Okay. Thanks, Will. Uh, it's always interesting to have an opportunity to talk about Singapore somewhere else. And so I appreciate the chance to be in front of you today in, in Hong Kong. And although clearly I'm not Singaporean by birth, my wife and I have raised our family there, our three kids there, and we've lived in Singapore 17 years. So from that perspective, I've gone from building software and hardware technology companies to working for Singapore government about four years ago. What I wanted to do is talk a little bit about what it is that we're trying to achieve. And importantly, this isn't about Singapore as compared to anywhere else. It's Singapore plus other places because all of the things we're trying to work on we think are going to be global challenges and we want to work with other people. And we'd like to learn how to work together today with a lot of you. So what I wanted to do is start off with what it is that we're trying to do in Singapore. We've been thinking about the startup nature of Singapore, the fact that we had to think about fresh water, we had to think about the product that we are, what's our economic model, who are our customers. So Singapore itself, we think of as a startup, and we think about the lessons that we learned, but we also think about where that's brought us today. So we went from being a startup to being a more mature entity, and that has certain implications and some of those are not easy for us to overcome. So part of what we're trying to do is think about how science-based work allows us to build companies that we believe will be globally relevant, and we'll talk about that. This is a shared challenge, the fact that we're all living in more and more densely populated places. So when we think about this, we're more densely populated than many places around the world. There is nowhere else to go in Singapore, even though we've reclaimed land from the sea, just as Hong Kong has, there isn't anywhere else to go. So we have to try and find a way to house people, care for people, move people around. So a densely populated environment is a significant set of challenges for us and all the implications that go with that. We also, as we would have just heard from the previous speaker, had to think about an aging population. But I wanted to pick the background videos for the specific reason that being older does not mean sitting in a chair and waiting for the end. There's a lot of activity. We want people to have active and fruitful lives for several reasons. One is because people deserve it. Number two is we need the economic output from every citizen that we're working with. So we want to think about these things. And as we go forward, this is a real scenario now that we have people living longer than ever. The previous chart just showed people roughly a third of the population over 65 in Japan worldwide. There's going to be more people over the age of 65 than below the age of five for the first time in human history in the next couple of years. So a complete change demographically. And again, I share that because of the implications around how people live and work, what happens. So we want to think about this issue. These are the two backdrops that we face as well as every country in the world. And the reason that that's relevant is it allows us to work with every country in the world. We want to build things that other people care about, and if we work on things that are too local in nature for Singapore, then we won't have the market, we won't have the investment, we won't have the outcome. So we start with what are some really tough challenges. Here's some really important things to think about. How do we move people around? So we're not thinking so much about electric vehicle, but this whole idea, as I'm sure Hong Kong is, and many of you from other places would be, how do we not have private car ownership? or how do we have a dramatically lower level of private car ownership. Singapore dedicates roughly the same amount of land surface to roads as it does to housing. So if we can think about less need to expand roads to take more and more traffic, then we can dedicate that to either green space, which is great for people, or high value such as education or healthcare or housing. So we're trying to think about not making things wider, but instead through autonomous vehicle, how do we get cars to travel? a meter apart at 100 kilometers an hour. A system can do that, but people cannot. So we're thinking about these issues. How do we have a healthcare system where people don't have to leave where they live to go across town to sit in a GP's office? How do we think about a vision in which the void deck or the below area of some of the housing in an HDB, Housing Development Board, how do we think of people just taking the lift downstairs a holographic image of their caregiver. There's already a genome sequence for that individual when he or she comes in, the wearables that you would have been hearing about, giving real-time data, 
And that caregiver can say, I like or I don't like what I see over what's been happening with you since I last saw you. They don't have to try and have people take time off to try and get them to the doctor, and they don't have to spend three hours waiting to see someone. We don't have enough healthcare facilities or enough caregivers if we look far into the future. So we're trying to think about how to completely change the healthcare model. Same thing with resources. We don't want to build more power generation plants on the island. We want to be more energy efficient, so we're not thinking about supply as much as we're thinking about how to improve consumption using analytics. Okay, so we, we like to have a little bit of a brag chart because Singapore puts a high value on being highly ranked. Sometimes that's a problem for us. But when we think about this, we have all these areas in which we are generally ranked to be top or in the top one or two. But the answer is, so what? This for us is, is a big mindset issue and that's where we wanted to focus our, our discussions. How do we think about this? And the answer is, okay, we have great scores here, we're highly ranked here, we're digitally ready, we have all of these things. So what can we do with it? And we've always thought about how can we be more highly cited? How can we have more publications? What's the H index? How do we think about these things? Now what we're saying is, what can we do with it? Not an original question, but it's going right to the core of how we're making resource allocation, how government's priorities are being laid out, what the education discussion is in Singapore from primary all the way through tertiary. So this is an area that we're really spending a lot of time on. Now, with respect to my friends at MIT Tech Review, there was an article about five years ago, why we can't solve big problems. I just slightly changed that a bit, why can't we solve big problems? So our challenge in Singapore is that we have lots of great resource, but we don't give ourselves credit for the ability to do something that would be important to the rest of the world. And so part of what we're trying to do is rethink, although we're not a big place, should we not aspire to have a disproportionate impact? And I hope that's the same thing that's on your mind. Certainly from the first few speakers, it seems to be. Here's what we're doing. The great thing about being able to look into the future with Singapore government is we know with supreme confidence that the investment for R&D is going to be the investment for R&D. There was a commitment last year to invest 19 billion Sing, which plus or minus is 16 billion US, into R&D over the next five years. There was a meeting yesterday at which I was present before flying here talking about some things that we're going to be doing in AI. So there was a separate investment just announced two weeks ago for a specific set of research, entrepreneurial activities, some things that we want to try and do with the private sector, some things that we want to do with VCs, strictly and specifically aimed at artificial intelligence. Now the question is, what does that mean? Natural language processing, do we think about computer vision and image recognition? Do we think about actuators? We're trying to think about a lot of different aspects of what we mean by AI, and we want to focus that on two or three use cases. For sure, how do we reconsider healthcare? For sure, how do we reconsider a system of autonomous vehicles relating to each other? But this is a separate war chest, just trying to focus in the near term on some things that we think will be important. So Singapore government is trying to put money behind these in a meaningful way. What we want to do is think about this. This is our big challenge right now. Going really fast, things are going well, and then this is what happens. Right? So, <laughs> this, is not, this is not me, by the way. This is not uh, me and the GoPro, but this is, this is just a way of representing what Singapore is concerned about, which is a very core, fundamental issue. We know how to do a lot of things. We could put AVs on the road en masse tomorrow. We could have a different healthcare system tomorrow, but this is what we're anxious about. We're anxious about going fast and having unintended and unknown consequences be the result. So for us, the challenge is not the technology, although there's always great things to be working on and inventing. The challenge is how do we confront the fact that we don't like it when things don't work well. And experimenting and exploring means, by definition, going into places that you don't yet know what it will look like and what will happen. So when we had a lot less to lose, we were willing to take a lot more risk. 
Pretty obvious stuff. Now, we treasure and prize things working well. So for us, having a 99.49s means we need to aspire and push harder for that fifth nine. It does not feel comfortable for us to say, what happens if an autonomous vehicle runs into something else? So we spend time saying, we need to look at that, we need to try and perfect the system, we need to simulate it 100 times before we deploy it. And you know what that means, is that you're always in this, let's just make sure everything is great before we deploy it. We are trying to cross that bridge right now into being open to taking some more risk. But this is a way of visualizing what we're anxious about. So this is why SG Innovate, which is the team that I'm building, was imagined. What we're trying to do is represent a hybrid between government and private sector. I've spent my whole career in private sector, except for the last four years. My whole team has spent their career in private sector. What we're trying to do is we are a private limited company wholly owned by the government of Singapore. I have one shareholder, the Ministry of Finance. So we are set up in a way that allows us to do things non-governmentally, but we work for the National Research Foundation for the science and research teams out of the universities. And this is what the Deputy Prime Minister said when he was at our space six months ago to launch us. He's asking us to be a startup, to think about rotating and pivoting and experimenting and exploring. So our charter is to do exactly what it is that we're saying we want to do. Encourage people to try new things. Now that's easier said than done, but that's our ambition. So we want to build from Singapore for the world. The challenge for us is we do not want to think about building for Singapore. We're not trying to solve a Singaporean problem. We're trying to solve a much bigger scale problem, but we'd like to do that with and from Singapore. Here's our definition. Ambitious and capable men and women. There's lots of people that are ambitious, and there's lots of people that are capable. Fewer people are both ambitious and capable. We'd like to work with people that want to have technology-intensive products. It's not our goal to do things that are easily replicated or cloned. We'd like to build on research IP, and we'd like to think about things that are globally relevant. We don't want to do things that are island-constrained. So this is what we stand for, and this is why we interview hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. The greatest thing about being set up as a private limited company is that we have the privilege of saying no because I used to run the government's technology agency prior to this life. And in that life, what we had to do was say, yes, we'd be thrilled to help you to as many people as we possibly could, because that's the role of government. But in this particular life, we set it up as a private limited so that we could say, we think you're amazing, but there's somebody else that's better able to help you. So we have the privilege of saying no, and that helps us really stay focused on what we're trying to accomplish most. Here's the four areas that we're focusing on. I won't go into them in any great detail, but one of the biggest things we can do is put early, early, early money into somebody that wants to build a company. So when investors say, call me once you've built something, call me once you've got 15 customers, and as you'll know, when you're talking about computer vision or you're talking about something that's a less familiar environment to some of the VCs, that first 100K or half a million is difficult. We want to be early money and we're trying to do that to encourage people to take that leap. We help with talent sourcing. We don't try and place people. We just say, here's 100 amazing engineers and scientists. Here's 15 cool companies. You should know each other. What happens after that is up to them. We try and think about customers. I took a company yesterday to go meet one of our big telcos. They're looking at IoT security. They wouldn't normally meet the chief of cybersecurity at one of the telcos because they're a two-person startup we can easily broker that. And if it gives that entrepreneur uh, an opportunity to talk about what they're working on, we're thrilled. And then we try and get them visibility. We just try and make sure that the world knows about what's happening so that these men and women have some support and some ambition. So that's what we do. We've been at this thing for six months, so we are early. I don't have hundreds of examples where we've been able to launch companies that have gone public, but we're excited about the progress so far. So here's just a couple of shots. We're trying to work in areas that you'll all appreciate and know, things that have to do with precision medicine, things that have to do with artificial intelligence. And the biggest thing that we're trying to do is bring people together. We're just trying to bring scientists, researchers, profs, postdocs, aspirational students from any university in Singapore. And because it's Singapore, like with Hong Kong, many of those postdocs are from around the world. So we have a Russian, mathematician working with 
a network engineer from India. Both did their postdoc work at NTU in Singapore. They're now building an IoT security company. So this is what we're trying to do is just bring people together and say, what can we do to help you build an amazing company? We've invested in 14 in the last six months. So we're trying to put our money to work. These are not big checks, but it just gets people off the ground, formed, IP filed. We help them. We have in-house IP agents. We have in-house legal for non-disclosure and MOU. We have in-house accounting. All we're trying to do is remove friction from those scientists, entrepreneurs, so they can focus on doing what they do well. This is what we're trying to make happen. And our goal is to stay with it. GIC, which is a sovereign wealth fund for Singapore, and Tomasic, which is an, uh, an aggressive investor on behalf of Singapore government, are both on my board because we want to make sure that when something is there, the big money is also there for them to get that later stage investment round. Here's some of the men and women in SG Innovate. We want to stay connected with people because we think it's a global effort. It's just what we're trying to do in our corner of the world. We'd like to see if there's something we can work on with you. So this is a way to stay connected with us. Thanks very much. Hold on a second. Um, that was great. Thank you very much. That was, that was really, really cool. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question, by the way. I'd like to take some more questions from the audience. The first question I have is, is the guy on the bike okay? <laughs> yeah, the guy on the bike's okay. <laughs> yeah. it, going over the edge and, and getting up off the ground, that's part of being resilient. So right, right. All turned out well. It's a, and it's a good metaphor. So what would that... What would, coming off the road look like for Singapore? Would it be investing too much in, in the wrong thing? Would it be... S Singapore, I'm, I'm sure like everyone. So the whole idea is, I always use the expression when people say, how does an autonomous vehicle know to differentiate between you know, a trash bin and a dog or a person? If you're thinking about LIDAR or other types of recognition. So the challenge is, we know how to make those choices. But when people start saying things like, hypothetically, would you run over this person, or would you instead choose that person? How does AI think of that? There isn't a way that a right. person makes a perfect decision. Mm -hmm. We're always anxious to try and think about what could go wrong, mitigate it to the best of our ability, and then once we've satisfied ourselves that the downside is almost zero, then we move forward. So our fear right now, and the bike metaphor, is because we think that we're going on a straight line and we're thrilled. We want to go faster, what we're anxious about is losing control in that turn, right. and something bad happens. And, you, and you've been testing self-driving cars, and I think a lot of people think that Singapore may be the place where self-driving cars first take off, but you, there, was, there was an accident recently. So did that, did that <laughs> <laughs> affect the public perception of the technology? You know, I, ironically, um, for those that know Singapore government, um, and when I was not in government, I, I thought it was a machine that uh, worked perfectly and everything was amazing. There is a lot of angst, meaning people are always in government worrying about what will someone think. And that's part of how Singapore aspires to, right. to stay at the top. So actually, the public wasn't at all <laughs> uh -huh. concerned about this AV, but there was policy makers and others that said, this is a really bad thing. Right. So the president of that AV company, I met with them last week, they're just now trying to put people back in front of the car, meaning to let them see that it's on the road. They've tried to stay a little bit quiet and okay. out of the public eye. But the point is, we all drive into each other unintentionally every day of the week, mm -hmm. and we accept that. Every piece of evidence shows that a system will have less accidents than people relating to each other, but somehow the anxiety is quite high. Quickly, there's the famous story about when the elevator was first invented and you had a gear mechanism that would engage to go up. As soon as it became automated and you'd press a button and there was no person in there, everybody said, I'm not going to use that. What happens if it goes out of control? So, that's where we are right now with AV. We could make the whole of Singapore autonomous bus and autonomous vehicle with not a lot of additional tech. Insurance right. policy, government policy, that would have to be rewritten. Yeah, and that could make a big difference to how automated driving spreads around the world, I think. Everybody's sort of looking to, to figure out how to present that public health case because it's true that self-driving cars, even if they do have an accident, they're going to be, be much better than the... Much, much better person. off. But ironically, there was a, a well-quoted piece of uh, anecdotal or well-quoted piece of evidence saying that some of the researchers involved with autonomous vehicles, when asked would they get into it, said, yes, I would. When asked would they put their children into it, <laughs> the answer was, not yet. So that's, that's what this I mean. is the human emotion side. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that would tomorrow have a chip in my body that would allow me to have 
continuous blood monitoring would help me monitor my microbiome, would give me the information to know that the people with whom I've socialized, the people that I'm spending time with on the airplane, the food that I'm eating, are doing what to me? Right. Instead of going to the doc twice a year for a blood test and you get that sort of keep up the good work type of output. Yeah. But when I say that, a lot of people say, are you out of your mind? That would be crazy. So everybody's on that continuum right. somewhere. And you, and you, you pointed to the, the feature we did on the, how, do we solve, how do we inspire people to solve big problems? How, how do you go about that? Because a lot of the entrepreneurs you meet these days want to create the next Snapchat. So how do, you, how do you get people to go beyond that? So this is where, this is one of my big pet peeves. I'm a big believer in where this thing called artificial intelligence, whatever we want to debate mm -hmm. about what it represents, but this idea that a machine can look at a million images and better articulate to the doctor whether there's something that ought to be further examined, more so than a person putting it up against a display board. We know that. But yet, Google was able to get DeepMind for less than half a billion. Snapchat went public at 48 times that valuation. Mm -hmm. So to me, that doesn't make any sense. So when we talk about investing in deep tech, a lot of our VC teammates in the private sector will say, you're building the wrong things. You should build B2C, you should build things that are application-based, you should mm -hmm. build things that people can download and you can get a million users by Friday, and then you, as SG Innovate, will be creating real value. And our reply is always, there's a lot of people doing that. We want to work with those men and women that have a bigger, longer-term aspiration. And because we're government-linked, I have one LP, and the LP is government. Government puts billions into R&D, puts millions into building that R&D into a company. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is better match the billions that go into the research with something that brings it to the real world. Right. So we work with people, and if the answer is 2% of the people in a room want to do that, we're going to work with those 2 or 3%. That's, That's it. We don't try and inspire a 1,000 entrepreneurs to, to become something. We just say, if there's two in this room, we'll work with that too. And two people can make a big impact. Great. Well, that is a, an inspiring note to finish on. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you.